Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is June 30, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 35. The issues that will determine the fate of Western civilization were laid before the world earlier this month. It happened in two commencement speeches on the 7th and 8th of June. One speaker diagnosed the decisive challenge now confronting the West. The other speaker dealt with our response to that challenge. The challenge to the West was set forth on June 8 by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the exiled Russian author, in his speech at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Pointing to the decline in courage that typifies Western leaders today, he reminded his listeners that, quote, from ancient times decline in courage has been considered the beginning of the end." Unquote. Considering the cause of our deterioration, he said, quote, How did the West decline from its triumphal march to its present sickness? The mistake must be at the root, at the very basis of human thinking in the past centuries." Unquote. And Solzhenitsyn identifies this deadly mistake as the perversion of our governing and social systems away from their original spiritual base. For example, speaking of the birth of the United States, he said, quote, All individual human rights were granted because man is God's creature. That is, freedom was given to the individual conditionally in the assumption of his constant religious responsibility. Subsequently, however, all such limitations were discarded everywhere in the West." Unquote. And so, according to Solzhenitsyn, we have put man in a position that should be reserved for God alone. Human rights and freedoms have come to be viewed as absolutes in and of themselves, and man and his material needs come first above all else. In other words, my friends, the choice before us is materialism or spirituality. The challenge facing the West is to restore spirituality to our entire way of life, otherwise the end is in sight. On June 7, the day before Solzhenitsyn spoke at Harvard, Jimmy Carter spoke to the graduating class of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. The audience in Cambridge had yet to hear of the challenge to the West from the famous Russian exile, but the audience at Annapolis got a taste of the response to this challenge from the President of the United States. Today it is the United States that is the custodian of Western civilization, and as the alleged leader of the Western world Jimmy Carter bears a unique responsibility to speak the truth and do so with wisdom and authority. He is also the only Western leader of today who has deliberately made his religious practices a conspicuous part of his public image. Yet you will search the Carter speech at Annapolis in vain for any trace of recognition of the spiritual challenge that Solzhenitsyn highlighted so clearly. Just the opposite, in fact. Jimmy Carter praised the United States philosophy as, quote, based on personal freedom, the most powerful of all ideas, unquote. And the underlying theme of the Carter speech was that the Soviet Union must choose, quote, confrontation or cooperation, unquote. These words are nothing more than a part of the propaganda barrage now underway to condition the American public for war, a war that Western civilization is unlikely to survive. Solzhenitsyn's words had the ring of truth because they are true, but because he dared to speak in spiritual terms he is being attacked on all sides of the major media. Those who are attacking Solzhenitsyn now are the very same forces of evil who a quarter century ago 
attacked the late great British historian Arnold Toynbee. Toynbee, of course, wrote the monumental work entitled A Study of History. Over a period of three decades Toynbee studied in mind-boggling detail all 23 of the separate full-fledged civilizations that are known to have existed in human history. Through a process of comparative study of these civilizations, Toynbee arrived at some very far-reaching and important conclusions about how they form, grow, and finally collapse. Toynbee's study of history was universally claimed as an astonishing feat of scholarship, and yet he was attacked viciously through the public media worldwide for just one reason. Toynbee's critics were driven into a frenzy over the religious approach he had applied to his work. In an Annex to Volume 5 of his Study of History, Toynbee warned of the repudiation of a spiritual principle. He described this phenomenon as, quote, the supreme danger to the spiritual health and even to the material existence of the Western body social, a deadlier danger by far than any of our hotly canvassed and loudly advertised political and economic maladies." Unquote. Today, my friends, we are witnessing the breakdown of one of the five civilizations that exist in the world today, that of the modern Western civilization. The growth and development of any civilization is a process of challenges and responses to those challenges. And as time be discovered, it is when a civilization fails to respond to an important challenge, especially a moral challenge, that breakdown occurs. History reveals that there is no hard and fast pattern that requires breakdown to occur at all, but once it does take place, the civilization starts disintegrating, and from then on modern history reveals not a single case in which the process of collapse has ever been reversed. History has another urgent lesson for us as well, and that is that civilizations are never destroyed merely by an overwhelming external attack. Instead, it's always internal decay that sets the stage for collapse, and so it is today. While Jimmy Carter spouts threats and propaganda according to the dictates of those who control him, the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn carry the weight of true importance proven by the entire history of human existence. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1 the breakdown and disintegration of Western civilization. Topic No. 2, the kamikaze plans of America's secret rulers. And Topic No. 3, the Kremlin plans for the interplanetary Russian Empire. Topic No. 1. After comparing the development of all the civilizations known to man, Toynbee concluded that all passed through a series of five stages. From beginning to end, a civilization is faced by one challenge after another, and it's the response to these challenges that governs the fate of the civilization. In fact, according to Toynbee, people do not develop civilizations at all except where they are forced to do so by challenges to their well-being. The challenge may come from living in physically harsh territory where ingenuity and organization afford the only avenue to a more comfortable existence, or it may come from predatory neighbors and competition for desirable land. But whatever the challenge, it is in overcoming this challenge that a society begins to transform itself into a civilization. The uniformity of tribal custom and activity begins to give way to specialized skills improved communication and organization, and a civilization is born. At the same time, according to Toynbee, an essential ingredient is also the emergence of a spiritual view of life that welds people together in ways that cannot be achieved in any other way. After a civilization has begun to develop, 
it passes into the second stage of growth and refinement. Increasing command over the physical environment is accompanied by the development of more advanced culture as men become free to devote more attention to the arts and to spiritual studies. In this dynamic stage the advancement of civilization is led by what Toynbee calls a creative minority. Quote, unquote. These creative individuals come to be followed by other members of society because their leadership brings benefits to society as a whole. This is the age of true and dynamic leaders. The third stage, defined by Toynbee, is called breakdown and is the turning point that spells eventual doom for the civilization. Having progressed and advanced by meeting successfully one challenge after another, a people may reach the point where they are unable to respond properly to the next great challenge they face. They lose the toughness of body and firmness of spirit that enables one to risk material possessions and even one's life to face up to a crisis. Spiritual exhaustion is translated into paralysis of effective action. Efforts turn not to overcoming the real challenge at hand, but to vain attempts to avoid the challenge. But this decisive challenge refuses to go away, and the failure to meet it properly is the turning point called breakdown by Toynbee. Once this breakdown is allowed to happen to a civilization, it begins to fall apart. The fourth stage, disintegration, has taken place very rapidly for some civilizations, very slowly for others. But in this phase the former creative minority is replaced by a ruling minority, that is, true leaders vanish from the scene to be replaced by rulers who try to preserve their power through force and intrigue. For a while they may seem to succeed through increasingly violent wars and even physical extension of an empire, but all of this is like the brief, awesome brilliance of a star that explodes into a nova moments before it fizzles and dies. Because the ruling minority are now ruling a society whose fabric has been torn beyond repair, internal divisions multiply, social disorder increases, standards of style and behavior become confused and jumbled. More and more people seek a way out of the unbearable present. Some long for the good old days, others seek to leap into the future and still others turn to religion, not for answers, but as a means of escape. Through it all the spiritual dimension that has characterized the earlier dynamic days of the civilization fails to reassert itself, and at the end of the fourth stage of disintegration the civilization reaches its fifth and final stage, dissolution. An entire civilization, a culture, a way of life is no more, and the survivors of the shattered culture gradually are absorbed into one or more new and different civilizations which build upon the ashes of the old. Of the 23 civilizations known to history, five remain in existence today. The modern Western, the Eastern Orthodox Christian, the Islamic, the Hindu, and the Far Eastern. Of these the first two are dominant today the modern Western and the Eastern Orthodox Christian, in terms of political and military power and are ranged against one another. One is the modern Western civilization with the United States at the nexus of power. The other is the Eastern Orthodox Christian civilization dominated by Russia. Many people believe that of these two civilizations, the Eastern Orthodox Christian civilization involving Russia and Eastern Europe has been largely transformed by the godless religion of Bolshevik Communism into a totally different entity. But there are major surprises in store. It is true that very major transformations have taken place, but as I first revealed last November in AUDIO LETTER No. 28, the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953 marked a turning point far more basic and important than is generally understood in the West. The first hint of the new course to be undertaken by the Kremlin was provided in 1953 
soon after Stalin's death by none other than Arnold Toynbee. In the course of a series of radio lectures, later published under the title The World and the West, Toynbee remarked on the spiritual initiative between East and West. Toynbee dumbfounded many by saying that this initiative, quote, has now passed at any rate for the moment from the Western to the Russian side." Unquote. In AUDIO LETTER No. 28 I explained that from the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 until Stalin's death on March 5, 1953, Russia was ruled by a coalition of two kinds of so-called Communists. The dominant faction during that period were the well-known Bolsheviks who were imposed upon Russia in 1917 with outside financing, much of it emanating from certain sources on Wall Street. But the other faction were the self-styled Spiritual Communists, an indigenous religious group inside Russia. Unlike the internationally oriented Bolsheviks, the so-called Spiritual Communists were and are strong nationalists and in secret they detested the atheism of their Bolshevik partners. For 36 years they worked patiently to prepare for the day when they would be able to achieve dominance over the Bolsheviks and thereafter gradually expel the Bolsheviks from their land. That day came with Stalin's death in 1953, as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 28, and since that day there have been no more of the bloody purges within the Kremlin that had been typical under the Bolsheviks. Now the power of the spiritual Communists in Russia has become great enough that a concerted campaign is underway to rout out all Bolsheviks that remain in positions of power and to expel them from Soviet Russia. Great numbers of these old-line Bolsheviks are now being welcomed with open arms into the United States by our secret rulers because a new Bolshevik Revolution is now being planned to take place here. In previous AUDIO LETTERS I have pointed out that Alexander Solzhenitsyn is not a refugee happy to escape from Russia. Instead, he is a passionate Russian patriot whose public dream is to return there. After his arrest with great publicity on February 12, 1974, he was exiled to the West, an experience Solzhenitsyn has described as spiritual castration." Quote, unquote. Solzhenitsyn believes that America and the West went wrong 60 years ago and he warns us of imminent disaster if we do not change course. Sixty years ago Christian Russia was infected with the spiritually fatal disease of Bolshevism, and not only did the West sit idly by and watch, but the secret rulers of the Western world were the source of the Bolshevik cancer in Russia. After saddling Russia with these evil forces, our own secret rulers then supported and maintained the artificial Soviet system established by the Bolsheviks. But now sixty years have passed. After three and a half decades of inhuman suffering under the Bolshevik Communists, the turning point came in 1953. Soon the famous de-Stalinization campaign of Nikita Khrushchev started closing the door on Bolshevism in Russia, slowly at first, but accelerating year by year. Today, 25 years after it began, the program of the so-called Spiritual Communists in the Kremlin against the Bolsheviks is reaching a climax. The Politburo, which rules the Soviet Union, is totally free of Bolsheviks and the process of rooting out all Bolsheviks from the Soviet governing system, while not yet completed, is now far advanced. As a result, the open practice of religion is reviving now in Russia and Eastern Europe. Churches and monasteries are being quietly reopened one by one, and even major religious gatherings have been permitted recently in Eastern Europe and even religious broadcasts. 
the people under Soviet domination do not as yet understand why these things are taking place, and it's all being done very cautiously, step by step, under watchful government eyes, to make sure nothing gets out of hand. The pressure of spiritual beliefs is the greatest of all those in the human makeup, and this is well understood by the new breed in the Kremlin today. So the plan is to release these long-suppressed pressures gradually but surely. A new day of open spiritual life is dawning in Russia after a long nightmare of horrors which we in the West have yet to experience. The scalding warnings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn are true, my friends, and those who are wise will weigh with care what he has to say. For Solzhenitsyn was sent to us by the Kremlin for a purpose. By listening to him we in the West can begin to grasp the spiritual dimension that is the real key to Kremlin thinking today. In his Harvard speech Solzhenitsyn said, quote, Six decades for our people and three decades for the people of Eastern Europe. During that time we have been through a spiritual training far in advance of Western experience. Life's complexity and mortal weight have produced stronger, deeper, and more interesting characters than those generated by standardized Western well-being." Toynbee would say that their civilization has been confronted by a tremendous challenge and in responding through spiritual experience has met that challenge. But what of the West? Solzhenitsyn answers, quote, Through intense suffering our country has now achieved a spiritual development of such intensity that the Western system in its present state of spiritual exhaustion does not look attractive." Unquote. And no wonder. As Toynbee discovered, spiritual exhaustion is the sign of a civilization undergoing breakdown. In other passages too, Solzhenitsyn described Western civilization in its present state as a system that has outlived its usefulness. He spoke of the warnings of history to, quote, a threatened or perishing society. Such are, for instance, the decadence of art or a lack of great statesmen." Unquote. And referring to the tendency in the West to desire an unchanging, comfortable existence above all else, he said, quote, This debilitating dream of a status quo is the symptom of a society which has come to the end of its development. Unquote. But the Solzhenitsyn indictment of the West goes far beyond mere uselessness and spiritual fatigue on our part. The picture he paints is that of a civilization that has in many ways become an evil blot on the face of the earth. He draws upon many examples ranging from the ease of triggering looting and rioting in our big cities to rampant pornography and violence in our entertainment to the betrayal of 30 million souls in the Far East into torment and suffering. And in his Harvard speech Solzhenitsyn summarized this ugly picture in the following words, quote, Very well-known representatives of your society, such as George Kennan, say, We cannot apply moral criteria to politics. Thus we mix good and evil, right and wrong, and make space for the absolute triumph of absolute evil in the world. On the contrary, only moral criteria can help the West against Communism's well-planned world strategy. There are no other criteria." Unquote. The rulers in the Kremlin today know all too well how it happened that Bolshevism seized Russia 60 years ago. They have spent their entire lives in a tireless campaign, not only to build their own power but also to rid Russia of the Bolshevik plague. Had the Bolsheviks been completely successful, all traces of Christian faith would have been obliterated from Russia, and today the Soviet Union would be Satan's own empire in alliance with our own secret rulers. The concentration camps and ovens of Hitler were but a pale shadow of what the Bolsheviks did to Christian Russia, and yet by the narrowest of margins Russia survived the mortal illness of Bolshevism. Having endured it all, 
a new and higher level of spiritual vigor is emerging in Russia today. But the Russians have learned a bitter lesson from their battle with the Bolsheviks. The Kremlin leaders of today would rather die than allow this cancerous spiritual disease to continue to stalk the earth. Their reasoning is that so long as Bolshevism continues to exist, there will remain the threat that someday, someday it might strike Russia once again, and next time the Bolsheviks might succeed, killing and destroying the very soul of their land. So to save their own souls, the Kremlin is out to eradicate Bolshevism from the face of the earth once and for all. In AUDIO LETTER No. 29, last December 1977, I reveal that America's secret rulers are now plotting to bring about a new Bolshevik revolution right here in the United States. To this end, massive numbers of old-line Bolsheviks who have been and are being expelled from the Soviet Union are being brought into the United States. Here they are being given government jobs at all levels in preparation for the revolution to come. Our secret rulers who belong to the same faction that installed the Bolsheviks in Russia 60 years ago think this will be their best chance to achieve total control over America and the war to come with the Soviet Union. But by doing this, our secret rulers are only multiplying the resolve of the Soviet Union to destroy the United States. To them we are like a rabid dog. The dog itself is a victim of a disease that makes the dog dangerous, but the only way to eliminate the danger is to destroy the dog. Russia was bitten once with the rabid disease of Bolshevism and nearly died. She is determined never to be bitten again. And so as the evil forces of Bolshevism are gathering, secret warfare is already underway as I have revealed for you over the months. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his speech earlier this month, quote, The fight for our planet, physical and spiritual, a fight of cosmic proportions is not a vague matter of the future. It has already started. The forces of evil have begun their decisive offensive. You can feel their pressure, and yet your screens and publications are full of prescribed smiles and raised glasses. What is the joy about?" Unquote. And on June 20, 1978, Rosalind Carter answered Solzhenitsyn by saying, quote, Alexander Solzhenitsyn says that he can feel the pressure of evil across our land. Well, I do not sense that pressure of evil at all." Unquote. My friends, many Americans believe that the Russians are getting everything they want already, so there will be no war. But the Kremlin rulers are motivated by a powerful spiritual drive to see Bolshevism erased from the earth. We in America are not meeting the challenge to root out Bolshevism in our midst, so the result will be Nuclear War One on American soil. Topic No. 2 Last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 34 I explained the long-term significance of the Battle of the Harvest Moon. This was history's first true space battle, fought in secret late last September. It ended on the day of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977, in a crushing defeat for the United States. As I told you last month, the Battle of the Harvest Moon was a turning point battle, like the Battle of Midway between Japan and the United States in World War II. And within hours after the space battle ended, Washington, D.C. was jumping with reporters because Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko had arrived at the White House for a rare late-night meeting with Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. The meeting, which came as a total surprise, had been demanded by Gromyko and had been granted instantly. This was the meeting that was described by breathless network reporters as resulting from a breakthrough quote, unquote, 
in the SALT II negotiations. But when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 26 just three days later on September 30, 1977, I told you the truth. Brovniko had demanded the late-night meeting at the White House to deliver a Soviet ultimatum in the wake of the Russian upset victory that had just taken place and the Battle of the Harvest Moon. As I told you then, all the reports at that time of an alleged SALT breakthrough were complete and deliberate lies on the part of the government and the controlled major media. Today, nine months later, there still is no SALT II agreement. We, the public, are supposed to have forgotten the cover story about a breakthrough nine months ago. Instead, now we are hearing about long, deadlocked SALT talks and early this month about reports of a freeze on the talks by the Carter Administration. The Turning Point Space Battle of nine months ago was the starting gun for a rush of military surprises since then. These I have revealed for you month to month, and now America's military predicament in any war to come with Russia will be untenable. Man-made catastrophe of unprecedented proportions is descending upon us, ranging from geophysical warfare to the beam weapons of Soviet hovering platforms called Cosmospheres. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it in his speech earlier this month, quote, A hundredfold Vietnam now hovers over you, unquote. Without a clear recognition of our true plight, there's no chance that it will be dealt with successfully. But our secret rulers got themselves and us and to the present horrible situation through lies, secrecy, and manipulation, and now they see no way out for themselves by telling us the truth. After all, they have for nearly two decades kept secret the ultimate military purpose of America's moon program. So how can they tell us now? How can they tell us that the moon flights did not end in 1972 as advertised? How can they now tell us about the secret American moon beam weapon base in Copernicus Crater which was knocked out last September? And how can they tell us of the grave threat we now face? How indeed! Having opened Pandora's box, our secret rulers long ago unleashed forces which are now beyond their control. And instead of admitting their misdeeds and so giving the United States a chance at survival, they are embarking on an all-or-nothing kamikaze plan like Japan in World War II. After Japan lost the Turning Point Naval Battle of Midway with America, the Japanese military posture started downhill. From that battle onward, the eventual defeat of Japan at the hands of the United States was only a matter of time. In the final months of the war, Japan was backed into a desperate corner. The war was exacting a fearful toll by then, and yet Japan's overtures to surrender were not accepted by the West. In sheer desperation, the Japanese turned to an all but unthinkable plan of counterattack, the kamikaze. The terror of a kamikaze attack had to be experienced to be believed. Even the most war-hardened sailors and naval officers found them unnerving beyond the actual damage they did, because every kamikaze plane was piloted by a human being whose ambition was to die in flames while destroying an American ship by crashing into it. Yet as nerve-shattering as they were, the kamikaze raids were hopeless. They were the suicidal last gasp of a nation that had already been defeated. Today our secret rulers are taking on a kamikaze mentality. Militarily they can already see the handwriting on the wall in the aftermath of the Battle of the Harvest Moon, but they have backed themselves into a corner through a web of lies and deceit from which there is no escape. They know they have already lost, but they are closing their eyes to this unbearable reality. Instead, 
They are pulling out all the stops on the political and military machinery now left to them, hoping against hope that they will somehow win the conflict to come. In the realm of foreign relations, our secret rulers are performing spectacular acrobatics brought about by their recent change of course. Four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 31 I revealed that Rockefeller doors are being flung wide open to Red China in a desperate effort to build up China as a threat against Russia, and now this campaign is coming to the surface. For example, in recent days the Carter Administration has given its approval quote, unquote, to plans of our NATO allies to sell China militarily sensitive equipment that is denied to Russia, as if China is now a part of NATO. And just five days ago Leonid Brezhnev No. 2, the ceremonial double seen in public since the real Brezhnev died last January, issued a warning about the new China policy of the Carter Administration. He said efforts are being made, quote, to play the China card against the USSR. This is a short-sighted and dangerous policy." Unquote. And he added that we, quote, may bitterly regret it." Unquote. Meanwhile, in connection with the so-called China card, Japan is being urged to hurry and cozy up to Red China and to rearm. To rearm is in direct violation of the Constitution that was imposed on Japan by the United States after World War II, and it is provoking intense debate there. At the same time, a complete reversal has taken place in the posture of the United States toward our NATO partners. For many years the policies of the United States toward Europe have been designed to fulfill Henry Kissinger's forecast of a Europe dominated by the Soviet Union since our secret rulers were then in bed with the Soviet rulers. But since the day of the Big Double Cross last September, the Battle of the Harvest Moon, our secret rulers suddenly need Europe. So a NATO summit was held in Washington at the end of last month. Our secret rulers tried to extract pledges from our allies to close ranks against Russia under Washington's leadership, of course, and to sweeten relations with Britain and France, a policy flip-flop to ease restrictions on the Anglo-French supersonic transport to Concorde was announced just three days ago. And just today Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd of West Virginia is to leave for Europe in an anxious effort to follow up on the NATO summit. But like everything else our rulers are doing now, the attempt now underway to patch things up with NATO is just too little and too late. Turkey, vital to NATO's southern flank, has just signed a treaty of friendship and cooperation with Russia, and West Germany, the linchpin of NATO, is already making its peace with Russia. Early last month, on May 6, Leonid Brezhnev No. 2 was in West Germany on a state visit. On that day Brezhnev No. 2 and Chancellor Helmut Schmidt signed a 25-year trade agreement, and this is only the forerunner of things to come. But the most serious of all the failures of our secret rulers concerning NATO is right next door in Canada. Three months ago I detailed the Soviet-French intrigues through which Canada is being prepared as a base for eventual invasion of the United States by the Russian Army. Early this month, on June 2, Canada expelled all United States fishing vessels from her territorial waters. It was just an echo of Russia's action last September, just before the Battle of the Harvest Moon. At that time the Soviet Union abruptly expelled all European community fishing vessels from her northern waters. The reason for Russia's action last September was military, as I explained then in AUDIO LETTER No. 26. And the reason for Canada's action now is military also, because now the sea lift of Soviet troops and equipment to isolated landing points on the Canadian coastline is being speeded up. Prior to the Battle of the Harvest Moon space disaster of last September, 
The deliberate betrayal of friends and allies was part of the grand design of our secret rulers. As a result, their pathetic attempts now to patch everything up will not succeed, but they are in a dream world of their own now, and their kamikaze plans are forging ahead in the military realm as well as in foreign affairs. Late last month, for example, Navy Secretary W. Graham Claytor launched a campaign to convince the American public, if not the Russians, that we are well able to fend off the tremendous fleet of Soviet submarines. Speaking of the critical field of anti-submarine warfare, Claytor boasted, quote, the qualitative edge that we hold over the Soviets in both equipment and personnel is awesome, unquote. And reports have been made public to paint the Navy's towed array sonar systems as a breakthrough light years ahead of anything the poor, backward Soviet Union might have. And just for good measure, American undersea warfare specialists have been quoted to the effect that Russian subs are so noisy that they are easy to detect. But my friends, the sheer numbers of submarines the Soviets can put to sea enables them to overwhelm NATO tracking systems. This they have proven on several occasions, as I've discussed last August in AUDIO LETTER No. 25. Beyond that, the Russians are actually well ahead of the West in the silencing of submarines. For example, there are the Russian missile-planting mini-subs which have crept into our own territorial waters to plant underwater launched nuclear missiles, which today are still there waiting to be fired. These mini-subs are invisible to all of our sonar systems, both active and passive. In AUDIO LETTER No. 16 for September 1976, I described these mini-subs, one of which had become trapped in Chesapeake Bay by a malfunction that killed the crew. It was a unique opportunity to learn how the Russian sonar defeating system works, but in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, I revealed how then-President Gerald Ford threw away this opportunity. As for the full-size Soviet subs, many of the older ones are relatively noisy, but those built more recently have a surprise in store. Knowing that American submarine detection technology is built almost totally around acoustic techniques, many of the later Russian subs are equipped with what is called an artificial acoustic signature. Each of these newer subs employs the world's most advanced design features for the purpose of minimizing propeller and wake noises. But in normal day-to-day -day operations they employ devices called cavitators that greatly increase the noise the submarine makes as it moves through the water. These are the noises that are detected by our passive sonar systems including the towed array systems that are supposed to be such a decisive breakthrough. These noise patterns, or signatures as they are called, are being programmed into the computers that are the key to our new sonar systems. But on the day that Nuclear War I erupts, all the Russian subs that are equipped with the artificial signature system will retract their cavitators. Then as they streak across the oceans toward the United States, they will do so in near total silence, and the slight noises that they do make in their wartime configuration will be unfamiliar and unrecognizable to our heavily computerized sonar defenses. The result, if the Russian technologists are right, will be the equivalent of a breakdown in our sonar defenses just when we need them most. Similar observations can be made in other areas of our military situation, such as the cruise missile which was demonstrated in public at White Sands, New Mexico a few days ago. But you may ask, what about our secret weapons programs? Two months ago I revealed that Operation Desktop has been reactivated. Under cover of oil and gas drilling operations at sea off the east coast of the United States, efforts are underway to plant a new fleet of Super ICBMs in launching sites beneath the sea. 
Exxon, which is doing this work off the East Coast for the CIA, spent incredible reimbursable sums in order to lock up large areas of the Baltimore Canyon area now being explored. But some of the other companies now drilling in the area are actually interested in oil, and so far they have met with disappointment. Early this month on June 2, Conoco announced that their first test well had turned out to be a failure. A company spokesman said, quote, I'd call it a deep disappointment. We spent $4 million and drilled out there for 53 days." Unquote. Meanwhile, the revived missile planting project is speeding up. Soon the Howard Hughes mystery ship, the Glomar Explorer, is scheduled to put to sea to begin planting CIA super missiles in the Pacific. As I have discussed in the past, this was the original mission for which the Glomar Explorer was designed, and now the official explanation has fallen back to the original cover story as well, and that is that the Explorer will be testing undersea mining hardware and gathering manganese nodules from the ocean floor. Can you imagine? In AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977, I described the capabilities and gave the exact locations of the original fleet of CIA undersea super missiles. Until their containment vessels sprung leaks and they were ruined one by one, these were by far the most awesome on earth. If more should be successfully planted now, they will share the same dubious distinction. But it will not matter. As long as the missiles remain in their, in their undersea resting places, they will be safe enough. They cannot be reached even with the Particle Beam weapons. But should they ever be launched, they will be destroyed as they rise from the sea, because of hovering over the site of each missile, the Kremlin plans to have at least two cosmospheres. As soon as the CIA missile breaks the surface of the sea, while it is still moving slowly and an easy target, it will be blasted by Particle Beam weapons. And so after spending vast taxpayer funds and tremendous effort to implant the new missiles, our secret rulers will achieve nothing more than several mammoth fireballs at sea. Russia itself will not be scratched. Is it any wonder that the Kremlin refers to the Russian Cosmosphere as the anti-war machine? But the most suicidal aspect of all in our secret rulers' actions now is the political aspect. Having decided that they cannot tell us the truth so that we can all work together, they reason that they must instead achieve utter rigid control over us all. And to this end all of their former plans for emergency and dictatorship are being reoriented toward a new end. The so-called Second American Revolution proposed by John D. Rockefeller III fizzled in its original form, but now it is being revived under new colors. Suddenly, as if everyone in America suddenly got the same idea at the same moment, the so-called Taxpayers' Revolt is erupting. The first American Revolution began over taxes, so it is being tried again with the goal of manipulating the American people into our own undoing over grievances which in themselves are valid. Already there is a drumbeat of calls for changes to the Constitution to limit taxes, and ultimately the total dismantling of our Constitution is intended to turn into a new Bolshevik Revolution. Nothing could be concocted that would more surely seal our doom at the hands of the Soviet Union, but that is what is planned. And at the supreme moment of crisis, when all are calling for an experienced hand at the helm, Someone will be ready. He is preparing now for that moment. His name, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, shades of his 25th Amendment. As America sinks toward final destruction, modern Western civilization is being dragged along toward its termination. But why is this taking place? The answer was given 600 years ago by the great Arab historian Ibn Khaldun. It is all explained in his Introduction to World History called the Muqaddimah, recently translated and published by Princeton University Press. 
Arnold Toynbee said it was, quote, undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place." Unquote. In my very first AUDIO BOOK TALKING TAPE nearly four years ago, I chronicled the birth of an incredibly powerful family dynasty in America a century ago, the Rockefeller Dynasty. By the beginning of the 20th century their power had increased to the point where the original governing system of the United States was being supplanted by their control. Instead of a system capable of continual renewal and regeneration, our country became entangled ever more tightly with the destiny of a single dynasty. Today this entanglement is complete. As goes the Rockefeller Cartel, so goes America. But as Ibn Khaldun established over six centuries ago, the natural lifespan of all true dynasties is approximately 100 years. This happens because in the course of three generations the original qualities of toughness and group feeling are lost. In place of striving there is luxury. In place of courage there is cowardice. In place of personal strength there are clients and followers. The dynasty becomes senile and breaks down. Today the four Rockefeller brothers of the third generation are on the decline. They still command great resources, and their client followers are legion, but they are surely losing control. Their policies have already destroyed what our forefathers created, leaving the destiny of our land tied to the destiny of their dynasty. Now the Rockefeller dynasty is reaching the end of its natural life, and as it collapses it is taking with it the hollow shell of what once was known as the United States of America. Topic No. 3. When a civilization comes to an end, it does not mean the end of all life for those who made up that civilization. What it does mean is the end of a way of life, and that, my friends, is what lies ahead for those who survive the man-made calamity to come. Sixty years ago the Eastern Orthodox Christian civilization centered on Russia was thrown into a desperate battle for its life. Through that battle it has itself been changed. We in the West do not view life from the perspective of sixty years of mortal combat for spiritual survival. So we would no doubt be shocked by some of the concepts of the new breed in today's Kremlin. But very, very important fact remains. Very powerful religious convictions are today a determining factor guiding the policies of Soviet Russia. In what country of the West can the same be said? The old line Bolsheviks who seized Russia in 1917 were parasites, destructive in every respect. By contrast, the self-styled spiritual Communists of the Kremlin today have a zeal to achieve bigger and better things for the glory of Mother Russia and, as they see it, for the glory of God. And once mankind is rid of the rabid disease of Bolshevism, the vistas they believe they see before them are breathtaking. Early in this century the Russian discipline called Cosmonautics was founded by a man named Tchaikovsky. At that time space travel was so far in the future as to seem a fantastic dream, but Tchaikovsky began his studies of cosmonautics with the dictum, quote, The planet Earth is the cradle of mankind, but man cannot forever remain in the cradle." Unquote. Today American spacemen are called astronauts, Russian spacemen cosmonauts and the difference goes far deeper than the name. To the Western mind space travel is mainly a stimulating technical challenge and an adventure, sort of a cosmic sporting event, but the Russians see it very differently. To them space travel is the beginning of man's expansion outward into his new, larger habitat, the solar system, and someday the stars. Already this change of perspective is reflected in the Soviet Cosmo Strategy and Cosmo Politics, which I described four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 31. 
Kremlin planning for the exploration and occupation of space has already gone far beyond the immediate narrowly military applications we see today, and in one respect Russia's plans for man's first interplanetary empire harken back to ancient Rome. In the Roman Empire conquered peoples became citizens of Rome, thereby sharing to some extent in the privileges and benefits the empire had to offer, and considerable autonomy was allowed in terms of local customs and religious practices, so long as they did not threaten or trouble Rome. Under the rule of those in the Kremlin today, the Soviet Union is beginning to do much the same thing. This has shown itself even in the program to begin expanding the Russian Empire into space. Several weeks ago Soyuz 28 was sent into orbit with one Russian and one non-Russian cosmonaut, a Czech. Four days ago the second non-Russian cosmonaut, a Pole this time, flew into orbit aboard Soyuz 30. The crew of Soyuz 30 docked with the Salyut 6 space station and entered it to join the crew of Soyuz 29, who were already there. The commander of Soyuz 29, by the way, is the Russian Neil Armstrong, Vladimir Kovalinuk. As I revealed last October in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, Kovalinuk was the commander of the first Soviet manned flight to the moon, which landed October 16, 1977, in Jules Verne Crater on the backside of the moon. In the view of Russian cosmonautics, man will inevitably move outward from Earth to the planets and stars, and it is meant to do so. So the Russian approach to space travel gives very heavy emphasis to philosophical and psychological factors as well as technical and physical training. Cosmonauts are taught to view the new environment of space as one that is a natural extension for man, but one requiring humility and caution. Part of the heritage of Russia is that of the seafaring Vikings of ages past. Today a spiritual rebirth is dawning in Russia. The Russian spirit is being drawn upward and outward to the limitless seas of space. Western civilization will soon perish, but not the human spirit. Lest we forget, our Lord's mercy and justice are meant at least as much for those who have suffered for decades as it is for those of us who have yet to suffer. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.